I guess we can come back. I was enjoying the music, but I guess since you're up next, we can go ahead and kick <laughs> things off here. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. If you're just joining us, then hello. Good morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on with our first gen summit. Thank you so much to our previous panelists. I was just typing my little fingers away because there were so many thoughtful little nuggets of wisdom and oh, thank you, thank you. So next up here, we have Oscar Garcia. He needs no introduction, but I will give him one. He is the Chief Empowerment Officer of Aspita Consulting. He's trained more professionals than at 33,000, but we might be at 50. We need to update that number. Um, today he is here and he will be talking about helping first gen students uncover their superpowers. I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you. And um, I know some of you know this because uh, you've attended several of our sessions, training sessions. But for those of you that do not know, Angelica is my daughter. So there is hope, parents, okay? For those of you that maybe are thinking of having your kids work with you, okay? There's hope. <laughs> okay. So everyone, uh, I uh, am going to spend a few minutes here with you on um, helping um, helping you to help first-gen students uncover their superpowers. And like I said, you feel free in the chat to send your questions. Uh, I will definitely leave plenty of time at the end uh, to answer questions that you may have. So um, here's a quick agenda. Uh, first thing is I wanna talk about what are some of the skills that employers are looking for today in, uh, in, in, in students. Number two, um, what are five things that we can do? And when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about obviously if you are a career counselor, career development professional, student affairs, and even as an employer looking to uh, recruit uh, uh, talent, first-gen talent. Number three, uh, how can we uncover first-gen superpowers? I'm going to walk you through a very um, uh, quick but very effective exercise that I walk people through to help uncover those uh, superpowers. And then number four, once you've helped your student uncover their superpowers, what are some ways that you can encourage them to showcase those superpowers, right? Because what good does it do to, to be, to have the superpower and then you're not letting the world know? Uh, I mean, Spanish, you know, you got to let the world know that you're chingona chingo, uh, or chingon, right? Like you're badass. You got to let the world know there's a time and a place for everything. And this is a time to let people know how amazing you are. And then, like I said, I'm going to leave some time for Q&A. All right. First off, I want to share with you uh, at the beginning, I shared that I am a first generation professional. Um, uh, English is my second language. Now, granted, I learned how to speak English uh, when I was uh, at, in kindergarten. But uh, like many first gen students, uh, immigrants, uh, the minute I learned how to speak uh, English, I became my parents' translator until they passed away about seven uh, years ago. Um, also, low income, I was on the free and reduced lunch program. And, um, and then also in college, I went to UC Berkeley. And even though in high school, I got all A's in English, somehow I get to Berkeley and they're like, Oscar, your writing and your reading skills are horrible. You need to go into remedial English class. And Really, that was like the first time that I really experienced that imposter syndrome, even though back then I didn't know that that's what it was called. But looking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. Um, and then also my mom and dad, basic uh, schooling, my dad, first grade education, my mother, middle uh, middle school uh, education. And, um, you know, I, again, as I've said before, I couldn't even go to them in third grade and ask them to help me with math, which is their numbers. OK, it's not like they're you know, Spanish numbers and American numbers, okay? They couldn't even help me uh, with that. And then lastly, my natural personality is an introvert. Uh, yes, I'm here to give you hope. Those of you that are introverts, those of you that are extroverts, I'm here to give you hope too uh, and teach you that God gave us uh, two ears and, uh, and a mouth for a reason to use it proportionately. So uh, let's get started here. Um, as I 
walk through and, and help you um, how to help students uncover the superpowers. I want to share with you that in my case too, it's been a process, uh, a, a long process. I'm 53 years old. It's taken me many, many years to just reframe my personal journey into a powerful career narrative because I didn't know how. No one ever taught me how to do it. All right. There are many career readiness programs out there. But listen, many of them are just vanilla, okay? And I don't really care for vanilla. Sometimes I want chocolate chip on that vanilla sprinkled, okay? Sometimes I want rainbow sherbet, all right? Um, and so let me give you an example. When I was in fifth grade, my, uh, my dad um, uh, uh, and my mom and dad on the weekends, we started going to the slaughterhouses throughout the, the Bay Area, killing a pig, cow, goat, selling fresh meat, totally illegal. My parents got busted by the health department multiple times, but they kept doing it anyways, okay? And as an 11-year-old, as a fifth grader, um, all of a sudden, my weekends as being a kid, playing with my friends, watching cartoons, you know, back then, the superheroes, gone, all right? I, I Honestly, like, I didn't really have that childhood, uh, normal childhood experience because every Saturday morning at 7 a.m., I was up, um, helping uh, in my parents' uh, family business. Uh, I was embarrassed about it. My friends would ask me why I wouldn't hang out with them anymore on the weekends. And I just was embarrassed. I didn't want to tell them the truth that I was doing what you see in this picture. There's my dad, my little brother in the middle, and me on the far right. Um, but when I look back at this experience, I learned very many valuable life lessons. I learned teamwork. I learned delayed gratification. I learned uh, a work ethic, right? I learned um, I learned some math, all right? Uh, giving money, you know, and you know, I, I was the cashier, all right? And I learned many, many things, even translating, believe it or not, going to the ranches and translating for my dad as he's over there picking the cow, the pig, or whatever, all that type of stuff. But see, as a kid, and even through high school, and even in college, I did this. We weren't selling meat in college, but we were making chorizo still. In fact, we were making chorizo. Up, I was already married, and Angelica and, uh, and my son, they were uh, probably like seven, eight years old, and still selling at the San Jose flea market. But in college, when it came time to fill out that resume, I didn't know how to list this experience on my resume. A uh, career counselor didn't know to ask me. In fact, I didn't even go to the career counselor. I can't even know career services existed at, at Berkeley. But my student affairs uh, uh, advisor didn't know to ask me. So what did that mean? That mean I was at a disadvantage. I had a resume that was so anemic, anorexic. Okay, I didn't have the, I interned at PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, you know, whatever, you know, the fancy place. I didn't. I was at a disadvantage. But here's the thing today, folks, okay? Today, I am teaching those, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers who, you know, now are in their 40s and 50s and got laid off, okay? Those engineers, you know, presidents of these companies, guess who's teaching them how to believe in themselves? Guess who's teaching them how to transition careers? Yes, this ESL introvert kid right here is teaching them, all right? So let's talk about what are some of the skills that employers look for. And this is based on a study, a recent study from Zeti uh, of the top 10 soft skills uh, that recruiters and hiring managers look for uh, in candidates. Number one, teamwork, Follow very closely by communication, time management, problem solving, creativity, leadership, organization, emotional intelligence, intelligence, decision making, stress management, I want you to think, because I know the answer, because I told you, I'm a first gen, you know, student professional. All these skills, when I look back at my life, personal life journey, I'm like, damn, I've done all these. In fact, some of these, I started doing them when I was, you know, seven years old. Yet many of you don't look at this first gen experience in, the, in this light, and you miss out on the opportunity to help your first-gen students uncover the gold that is inside the diamond and the rough, folks. And that's what I'm here to teach you, okay? Because here's the thing. Society puts negative 
labels on us first gens. The word first gen does not have a positive connotation in our culture, folks. Typically, it means low income, underrepresented, English as a second language, you're a minority. These labels do not have a negative connotation. I don't see any of you walking into Louis Vuitton purse when you're buying a purse. I'm like, hi, everyone. I'm a low income, former low income. Uh, no. Right? I mean, think about this. Some of you have heard me say this. When Neil Armstrong was the first human to land on the moon, what do our history books call him? A pioneer. How come we don't call him a first generation moon lander? Oh, but you call me a first gen, right? And everyone else first gen. No, we are pioneers. And I think this is one of the first steps is that we need to change the way we refer to first gens because yes, words do matter, folks. Why do they matter? Let me share something with you. We oftentimes doubt ourselves. And I, you know what? I didn't grow out of, uh, pop out of my mother's womb doubting myself, okay? A lot of it comes out because of the fact that the society uh, and the labels that are pressed, uh, 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 put on us, all right? Why do you still doubt yourself? You became the family translator at five. You started babysitting at eight. You helped your parents with their taxes at nine. You paid the family bills at 11. You told your parents what documents to sign at 13. You started making family medical decisions at 15. You started to financially support your family at 17. You did all this before you could legally vote. Why do you still doubt yourself? Not all superheroes wear capes. Not all superheroes choose to be a superhero. You are a superheroine. Folks, this is the life, the experience that many first gens go through. This is my life. I just described. This is what I went through, folks. If I am a an employer looking to hire someone, you know what? I don't give a rip that you went to Berkeley, Harvard, Stanford, whatever. I don't give a rip how many PhDs you have after, you know, letters you have to your name. I would hire this person in a heartbeat. All right. So here are five things that we can do. Number one, folks, is initiate outreach. Oscar, we are, you know, we, we email students, we do this and that. Okay, can you like reevaluate your outreach efforts? Are they effective? Or are you just checking off the box because your boss doesn't have the time to really monitor the results? This reminds me of about 12, 15 years ago, my family and, and, and some friends got involved uh, in organizing parents to go to school board meetings uh, to advocate on whether they wanted their local school closed or open. 90% of the students at this particular school were Spanish speaking parents and, the, and the parents were completely disenfranchised. And I remember early on uh, during our committee outreach efforts, speaking with the superintendent of the school district and saying, gosh, I only see like about five parents at all going to these school, your school board meetings. And this is obviously a very important topic. Are you like, how are you communicating? Well, Oscar, we actually send down, you know, um, um, uh, notices and we pin it to all the students, um, you know, backpack or jacket or whatever. I'm like, well, obviously that's not working. And so what we did is we, in, in my city, there are two Catholic churches. Each Sunday, there are over 200 parishioners that attend the Catholic church. And I went to the father and I explained to him what was going on, asked him if he could give me five minutes at the end uh, of uh, mass to invite parents to a meeting so I could educate them. And he said, yes, everyone, the last two school board meetings, there were over 300 parents attending that school board meeting, standing room only. Obviously, the school district outreach efforts was horrible. Number two, we need to listen more. This is kind of a tricky one because we are the experts, right, in advising these students, giving that career guidance. But here, when I'm talking about listening more, sometimes we need to listen to what they're not saying. We need to listen to that body language because oftentimes that says a lot more than what they are verbalizing. Number three, be a connector, folks. Be a connector. Um, you know, I... I we include it uh, for you to um, uh, and the registration to share your LinkedIn uh, contact. Some of you, many of you did, some of you didn't. 
Um, but you know what? What I found a trend is many career development professionals, you're not using the tools that you are teaching students to do. So how can you be a great connector if you're not using the tools? Folks, I'm not looking for a job. I use LinkedIn partly for this. About two years ago, I had a community college district reach out to me because they were wanting to do some fundraising. And they said, Oscar, can you put us in touch with any of your tech professionals? Because we're looking, again, we're doing for some fundraising. I did an email introduction, folks. That email introduction raised $10,000 for that community college just through an email introduction. Hello? I'm being a connector. In fact, I'm being a bank in a way. Number four, celebrate the wins. Next week, November 8th, first gen, uh, national, national first gen day. Awesome. Keep celebrating the wins 365 days, okay? You don't just tell the person you love, you love them on the day you marry them or one time. You got to remind them 365 days. Celebrate the wins, folks. And then lastly, Share your story. One of the things that first gen students do is we oftentimes share our struggles with you because we trust you. But if you want to develop an authentic, deep, meaningful relationship, you need to be vulnerable and share your stories uh, as well. Like don't do something that you, that you want your students to do, but you're not willing to do. You go onto my LinkedIn profile and social media, I pull my heart out there. But this presentation here, I'm telling you how screwed up I am and I've overcome the challenges. But somehow, some of you, you forget you're talking to students. I applaud your level of, of education. You have a doctorate. But can I tell you something, folks? I'm a CEO too of my company. Uh, of my company. I don't give a rip about that. I come down and I connect with the, with the, the, the student's heart, not intellectually. Let me show you a couple of examples here. I love these two gentlemen that I'm connected with on LinkedIn. Dr. John Hernandez, who is the president of Irvine Valley College. You, you go onto his LinkedIn profile. And I, I, some of you, it amazes me. I'm like, I never post anything personal on LinkedIn. It's your LinkedIn account. It, post whatever the heck it is you want. Like, what is it? Is there a LinkedIn mafia that tells you you, you can only post certain things? He goes, Neil. Look at him. He's over here recently, four days ago. At today's lunch with the, with the president, I had the opportunity to break bread with IBC's Puentistas, et cetera, and so forth. And look how cool it is. Like like Angelica mentioned earlier, I want to be able to just come back, go back to college and, you know, hang out with Dr. John Hernandez, man, yeah, Mr. Cool Dude over here. And then over here, Dr. Mike Munoz, president of Long Beach City College too as well. Just yesterday posted uh, pictures of the Halloween party right? Oh, this is not professional. Thank God it's not professional. It's human. Folks, it's humanizing the experience. And as a first chance, this is what I want to see. I don't want to see you in your Ivy Towers. I want to see you put those green glass shades on and, you know, make me feel like you're one of us. You go on here. Here's in my example. You go into my LinkedIn, or excuse me, our website. You know, some people you go onto their website and they're like, you know, their bio, you know, oh, Oscar Garcia, you know, graduated from UC Berkeley, top of his class, but, which that's not true, okay? But blah, 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 whatever. Now, here it is, all right? Right there on, my, on our website, okay? How it started. As a Mexican-American, my dual cultural identity has been an asset and, and a liability. In the US, I'm told I'm too Mexican. In Mexico, I'm told I'm a gringo. I was made to feel different. Yeah, and then on the right, I'll tell you what's up. Because I am going to tell you how badass getting going I am. Because it's true. I own it. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud of it. Worked my tear, you know, my rear end off to do this. But there it is, folks. Connecting with the heart first. All right. Let's talk about uncovering some first-gen superpowers here. This is a very powerful and effective exercise. Pay attention, all right? Here, I'm, what, what I'm going to do next. What I want you to do is I want you to ask your students to write three columns, okay? Column on the left is life experience. Column in the middle is your feelings. And then the column on the right is your skills, okay? Or superpowers. On the left, have them write down some of those life experiences. I mentioned to you about the family business, okay? So there it is. 
What is the feeling? Have them describe that feeling. Normally, typically this feeling is kind of a yucky, unpleasant feeling. So I shared with you that I was embarrassed about working the family business. Then on the skills, the superpowers is what are the skills that you learned from that experience? And I, I mentioned to you, one of them is a work ethic. I, number two, I remedial English class at Berkeley. I felt inferior than imposter syndrome, but a skill that I learned was how to be coachable. Why? Because I went to the college professor. I went to my, my floor mate, you know, the professor, anyone that could help me uh, improve my writing, I went to and coachable. And again, you just go, there's more than life experiences, layoffs, anxiety, networking, et cetera, and so forth. That middle column of feelings, the reason why I ask people to write that feeling is because, because I, I want you to own that feeling that oftentimes is unpleasant instead of having that feeling owning us kind of that healing process, right? Like I can talk about this now, all right? Instead of making the uh, feeling inferior. But this is a very, like I said, a very effective, powerful, simple exercise to help your students reframe that experience into a very powerful career narrative that they can then speak from a position of strength and in a language that a hiring manager, recruiter understands on a resume, cover letter, interviewing, LinkedIn uh, profile. Okay, so we've helped students uh, uncover those superpowers. Let's help them showcase their uh, first-gen superpowers. I want to share some, an example here. This is on LinkedIn. I don't care. You can use whatever platform, okay? I just um, We're talking about career and LinkedIn is the gorilla out there right now, okay? But it's not the only platform. But here is my buddy, Marco Espino, who talked about uh, his experience of uh, being a first-generation college grad. Uh, and he's got a picture, obviously, on the right where he worked at McDonald's and then his graduation picture. And he shares a quick little story about his journey. And on LinkedIn, he garnered almost 30,000 engagements and over 1,600 comments, which, by the way, engagement comments on LinkedIn, you're going to get a lot less number-wise than you will on other platforms. But like I always tell people, I would rather have 10 of you professionals engage with my content than a 1,000 knuckleheads on Facebook. Also, here's another place. You can take that experience, right? That first-gen superpower journey experience, put it on a resume, kind of like Angelica here uh, has done under her personal profile, right? The little summary section, you know, that she has uh, included here. This is another uh, example. Another example is some students create an online portfolio, a website, where they highlight their experience, their work, et cetera, and, for, and so forth. My buddy Zane did the, uh, did uh, just that. And here's uh, his little about section that he um, uh, included on his personal uh, website, personal online uh, portfolio. Again, these are some examples of where you can help students showcase a work beyond the traditional resume, LinkedIn, et cetera, and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna leave you with some final thoughts here and I'll open up to uh, some questions here. I wanna leave you with what I call the credo for first-gen professionals. And it's something that I created that helped me break free from society's anchor labels. Um, when I changed that narrative to see the positive attributes of being a first-gen professional. So what does um, first-gen stand for? The F stands for Fear, we're the first in our family to do many things. We experience fear, yet we embrace it. I don't subscribe to the be fearless concept. I don't. I still, even though I've done thousands of talks, I still experience fear, those, butter, those butterflies in my stomach. I'm just able to control them today. But I, I'd be lying to you. be like, oh, yeah, no. I mean, it's easy for me to uh, talk to. No. So that's why I say we experience fear, yet we embrace it. I stands for initiative. 
we act on opportunities in spite of what other uh, do or don't do. We don't wait for someone to open the door for us. No, we pave our own path. And if there is no door, there's a wall. We bust that wall down. We jump through over that wall. We go around that, whatever. But we take the initiative. R is for resilient. We get up more times than we fall. We, I have fallen so many times, but guess what? I keep getting back up, back up again. S stands for servant attitude. We lead with our heart. We always looking to help others. T is for tenacity. We are relentless in the pursuit of our dreams. We don't quit. G is for gratitude. We don't forget where we come from and are grateful for everyone's support. Thank God, by the grace of God, my third grade teacher, my sixth grade teacher, uh, eighth grade uh, Spanish teacher um, uh, in high school, Mr. Randall Geometry, programs like uh, EOPS, MESA, which is stands for Mathematic Engineering Science Achievement, that served as my bumper paths in life to keep me from going into the gutter. And at least I was going to knock down a pen, maybe 10 if I got lucky. And E is empower others. We have one hand up, one hand down to bring others along. Sometimes I hear, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. No, knucklehead. Maybe you're there because you need to help the people that are in that room. Don't leave the room. That. I will tell you is a stereotypical American attitude. What's in it for me? And it uh, stands for no. No is yes. Our ears hear no. Our heart says, yes, I can. In high school, senior year, or junior year, my high school counselor, Oscar, where do you want to go to college? Honestly, I didn't even know, okay? But I knew how to play the game. Uh, um. Uh, UC Berkeley. Why? Because it was the closest school here and my uncle lived near UC Berkeley. That was it. And she's like, Oscar, you don't have the grades and SAT scores to get in. You shouldn't apply. Well, my ears here, no, heard no, but my heart said yes. And I went ahead and applied and I told you I got accepted. I graduated from UC Berkeley. So there. Thank you, actually, high school counselor for motivating me. So folks, I'm going to close it out here. My goal and everything that I do is to empower you, or in this case, to help you empower your students so opportunities come to them. So um, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you and see if there's any questions. Um, here's our contact info, folks. Some of you already connected on LinkedIn. You can follow the podcast, Career Talk with OG, on, um, on Instagram, YouTube channel, email. And, and folks, I'm like super accessible. I, I think like overly accessible. All right. But that's okay. All right. So um, anyways, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of uh, buzzing in the chat here. Uh, Christina and I agree that if we start a TikTok channel, you are going to talk about the first gen credo, but it's going to be the YMCA song in the background. Um, and that's our plan. <laughs> our plan for you um one of the questions that and it's been popping out throughout the panels here is talking about career services and this approach of like we're here and i believe there was a few of us who were talking about kind of going back and forth of like the best approach and kind of like methodology in terms of like getting first gen students to take advantage of the resources that are there because there's a lot of resources but sometimes career services tend to be just taken by okay we're here like they know about us the students will come once they you know they're in desperate need of us um but we don't want it to get to that point where it's like you're in such desperate need and you're like, okay, finally, I'll cave and I'll go there and I'll go seek help. So I was wondering um, what advice or, you know, just based on your presentation, what are some tips and, you know, how to best to kind of get those students to come, but also, you know, maybe even more meeting halfway. Yeah. Uh, uh, so first off, I think that this, the, the results, there's things we can do now, but also realize that the results, meaning to the, seeing an increase in students taking advantage of these services, will take time because 
there's um, there's many factors that come into play here. As a student, you were you have to feel comfortable and eventually right realize like oh this is a, you know the career services this is what it does and so forth. It's not something that you just start doing right away and then you know career services is going to see an influx of of, uh, of students. It takes some time, but um, one of the things is certainly um, what some colleges and universities are doing, and that is like next week, right, doing a national first-gen day events. Uh, like I said, some of them are creating uh, week-long uh, events. Um, but the other thing too, throughout beyond these events or th th these timeframes is, I think it's important for career services staff to get out into some of the student groups that are out there and attending, participating, and, and uh, Brian really brought up a really great point uh, in when he was talking about these uh, dying experiences where you get out and really connect with the leadership of these student groups and they get to know you, you get to know them instead of coming in with the agenda of like, oh, here's, you know, this workshop and so forth, which it's important, but it's building that relationship many times. We are very transactional, the way we operate, and we really need to be relationship first, business second. Build that trust, that relationship with those student organizations. They understand. And then what happens is those student leaders become your champions, your advocates, your sponsors to the rest of the group that then eventually funnels into, right? Um, Another thing too is, is that look at leveraging your strengths in um, your area of expertise with different organizations, whether it's on campus or off campus, maybe the alumni association. I know, for example, at UC Berkeley, I used to be on the board of the Chicano Latino uh, Alumni Association. And so we can also... Um, uh, be uh, of of help, or these associations can be of help, whether it's being as a speaker, mentor, you know, encourager, et cetera, and so forth. So those are a couple of things that I uh, encourage uh, colleges uh, to do to, to help. Thank you. And yes, you echoed a lot of what Brian said earlier, but also it's, it's very easy and it's a very fine line between, you know, sharing the services that are available, but then coming off as like, in a patronizing or like you need help so here you go like I can tell you're struggling so you need to you know take this class so much appreciated before we move on last question here what and I know we've also had a few of the student panelists touch upon this but um imposter syndrome and you know a lot of times that's what's keeping students from again identifying their student powers um or their superpowers excuse me and oftentimes they identify a skill and they see that, oh, you know, that's not really, you know, everyone has that skill or that's something that, you know, that is, you know, that's just minimal like that. And they write it off as something ins insignificant. So what advice do you have in terms of imposter syndrome and how to kind of, you know, oh, not so much overcome it, but how to approach it when you're trying to identify your superpower? Yeah, and I actually do uh, a workshop on overcoming imposter syndrome and uh, commanding executive presence. But um, but here's the thing is, I believe that, uh, and I, again, as I've studied more imposter syndrome and just my own personal journey, I don't think imposter syndrome is something that we completely eliminate, but it's something that we also learn how to manage, just like the fear like I, earlier of speaking or public speaking. I've learned to control it, right? Um and, and and so we learn how to manage it. The other thing too that I've learned throughout my career journey is that we all experience some form of imposter syndrome. I know professionals that I still hold in very high regard that are afraid to do certain things or they question and I'm like oh my god but this person has a whatever credential or you know is the head of this organization wow, they can't, oh my gosh. And I've also been in situations where, um, again, you know, at UC Berkeley, like I shared with you, you know, freshman year walking onto the campus, you know, feeling insecure because I was in this remedial English class. And then fast forward about 
seven years ago, six, seven years ago, I get invited by the Alumni Association to go do a workshop on career transitioning. And in my workshop, there are professionals that are engineers, vice presidents of companies. And all of a sudden I realized like, this is, life is really interesting because I felt inferior to these engineers, these vice presidents back then. And today I am teaching these engineers, these vice presidents, how to, like I said, believe in themselves, how to transition careers. And so it actually, I didn't feel better than them, but it strengthened my, the belief in me that I can do it and I have it. And so folks, if there's, if there's those of you that are younger, look at some of these uh, professionals that, you know, are further along and feed off that, that conviction that they have that belief in themselves borrow some of that because again i'm telling you we all experience imposter syndrome it's just learning how to manage it getting those butterflies to fly in formation yes if you will. <laughs> well perfect well awesome thank you so much we're gonna go ahead here and i know we we still got more goodies to share more stories